On July 16th, 1967, John William Farrell was born in Irvine, California, the son of Roy Lee Farrell, a saxophonist and keyboard player for the Reichs Brothers, and Betty K. Farrell, who was born Betty K. Overman, who was a teacher who taught at Old Mill Elementary School and Santa Ana College. As an infant, Farrell suffered from pyloric stenosis and had a pyloromyotomy to correct the condition. When Farrell was eight years old, his parents divorced. He first attended Culverdale Elementary and later attended Rancho San Joaquin Middle School, both in Irvine. He attended University High School in Irvine and was a kicker for the school's varsity football team. He was also on the soccer team and captain of the basketball team, as well as serving on the student council. In the senior year of high school, he was voted best personality by his classmates. He enrolled at the University of Southern California, where he studied sports broadcasting and joined the Delta Tau Delta fraternity. Farrell earned an internship at a local television station in the sports department, but he did not enjoy the work. After graduating with a BA degree in sports information in 1990, Farrell knew that he did not want to do broadcasting. After unsuccessful stints as a hotel valet and teller at Wells Fargo, he was encouraged by his mother to pursue something he liked. In 1991, he moved to Los Angeles and successfully auditioned for the comedy group The Groundlings, where he spent time developing his improvisation skills. Farrell starred in the advanced classes in The Groundlings and grew to love improvisation. He liked to impersonate people, and one of his favorites was baseball announcer Harry Carey. With fellow Groundlings member Chris Kattan, he created the Butabi Brothers, who go out to dance clubs to try to pick up women, but are constantly being rejected. While taking classes, Farrell got a job at an auction house. By 1995, he was receiving small roles in TV shows such as Grace Under Fire and Living Single, and in low-budget films such as A Bucket of Blood. After Saturday Night Live's decline in popularity in the 1994-95 season, and in need of new cast members for the next season, the producer saw the Groundlings and asked Farrell, Catan, and Sherry O'Terry to audition for Saturday Night Live's main producer, Lauren Michaels. Farrell joined Saturday Night Live in 1995 and left in 2002 after a seven-year tenure. During his time on Saturday Night Live, Farrell made a name for himself with his impersonations, which include George W. Bush, Harry Carey, Robert Goulet, Neil Diamond, Inside the Actors Studio host James Lipton, Uta Bomber Ted Kaczynski, Jeopardy host Alex Trebek, Jesse Ventura, Al Gore, Sama Hussein, and Fidel Castro. His original characters included Morning Latte's co-host Tom Wilkins, music teacher Marty Culp, cheerleader Craig Buchanan, Dr. Beeman, and nightclubber Steve Butabi in sketches that were turned into a feature film in 1998's A Night at the Roxbury. During his time on Saturday Night Live, Farrell appeared in several movies, Austin Powers, Powers, International Man of Mystery, Superstar, The Ladies Man, Dick, Drowning Mona, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, and finally Zoolander. Uh, his first starring role after his departure from Saturday Night Live was Frank the Tank Richard in Old School, released in 2003. Uh, the movie was a success, and Farrell received an MTV Movie Awards nomination for Best Comedic Performance. The title role in Elf, which was also released in 2003, followed. Farrell continued to land comedy roles in 2004 and 2005 in films such as Melinda and Melinda, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and Starsky and Hutch. In 2006, Farrell starred in Stranger Than Fiction and Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. In 2008, Farrell starred in Step Brothers with John C. Riley and Semi Pro with Woody Harrelson.
I got this DVD that had been in CVS in the middle of the pandemic for $6.99 and quickly forgot about it. Uh, but the Big Lebowski DVD was back ordered. So when I was cleaning up, I came across this DVD, which at $6.99, which is less than uh, $13.91, uh, less than or equal to $13.91, clearly qualifies as a low budget review. However, I really didn't have the time to view three movies for this week's LBR, so I only viewed one movie. I chose to view Semi Pro because, as a fan who's interested in sports history, I thought the premise of this movie was mildly interesting. Um, anyway, the price was right, so and I didn't have to leave my desk to watch the movie, so I did. Watch the movie, that is. On February 29th, from the studio that brought you The Notebook, New Line Cinema presents... Ow! Woo! Heart attack! The most uplifting... One lucky fan will go home with a game ball! Touching... You did not deserve that. Uh, no. I apologize. ...and inspirational movie... You guys fans! ...of the new year, Will Ferrell. Ah! Semi-Pro. This isn't just a basketball team. This is a way of life. Uh... Rated R, February 29th, only in theaters. Jackie Moon, played by Will Ferrell, who is a singer who had a one-hit wonder, Love Me Sexy, uses the profits from his hit to buy a basketball team in the American Basketball Association, known as the Flint Tropics. He is the owner, head coach, power forward, and pregame announcer. The Tropics are a team that are flashy, but have no substance, and the Tropics are the worst team in the league. Uh, Jackie Moon, however, thinks he's going to be redeemed, as the ABA is going to be merged with the National Basketball Association, so thus he will become the owner of an NBA team. But the ABA commissioner, Alan Alt, played by David Kochner, uh, reveals that only four teams will move to the NBA, and those four teams, of course, are the New York, New Jersey Nets, the Denver Nuggets, the San Antonio Spurs, and the Indiana Pacers. Uh, all sports fans should know that. Uh, Jackie argues that the teams with the four best records should be merged, and the commissioner accepts. Jackie Moon tells this news to his team. They are depressed because they think there is no way that the Flint Tropics can finish in fourth place. Uh, but Moon is optimistic and he trades the team's washing machine uh, to the Kentucky Colonels for Ed Monix, played by Woody Harrelson, who is a backup point guard who won an NBA championship with the Boston Celtics, even though he didn't play during the playoffs. Monix visits Lynn, played by Bora Tierney, who is his former girlfriend and expresses an interest in her even though she has a current boyfriend. The commissioner also reveals that in addition to finishing in the top four, uh, the Tropics must draw at least 2,000 fans in every remaining home game. Moon stages increasingly desperate promotions to boost attendance, including giving out free corn dogs, wrestling a bear named Dewey, and offering $10,000 to a fan if he makes an impossible free throw. A hippie named Duke does make the free throw, but Moon doesn't pay him. Uh, Monix knows that in order to finish the fourth, the Tropics must focus on fundamentals and thus takes over coaching duties. As a result, the Tropics go on a winning run, moving from last to fifth. Jackie gets a visit from the commissioner. Um, the NBA does not think that Flint has a large enough media market to sustain a team, and thus will not allow the Tropics into the league even if they beat the San Antonio Spurs in the last game of the season, so they will be dissolved uh, once the season ends. Then Jackie gets depressed, admitting that he stole Love Me Se Sexy from a napkin that his mother wrote three, day three weeks before she died. Realizing that all his assets are basically stolen, Jackie trades Clarence Withers, aka Coffee Black, played by Andre Benjamin, 
who is the Tropics' best player, to the Spurs so that he may realize his dream of playing in the NBA. In the meantime, Monix reassembles the team, inspiring them to leave everything on the court. He tells them that while they may not be able to continue the franchise after this season, they have come very far and still have a lot to prove. Jackie promotes the game as the Flint Michigan Mega Bowl, hoping to stir up interest in what's essentially a meaningless game. His promotion works, and fans assemble from around the state to attend the match. In the last game, the Tropics do poorly in the first half, falling behind by double digits. To make matters worse, Jackie is injured and rendered unconscious, but Coffee Black defects, abandoning the Spurs to play with the Tropics. After a near-death experience in which his mother forgives him for stealing her song, he regains consciousness. He reveals that his mother revealed a new move, called an alley-oop, that will ensure victory. In the second half, a fired-up Tropics narrow the Spurs' lead. With 12 seconds left, the Spurs cling to a two-point lead. Jackie is fouled and goes to the free-throw line for two shots. Jackie makes the first shot, but the second shot misses. Monix rebounds and gets the last basket, and with time expiring, the Tropics have won 118 to 117. The celebration turns into a riot, with a mob of fans overturning a police cruiser. Spurs coach forgives Coffee Black and lets him stay on the team. The commissioner, congratulating Jackie, offers him a job to do NBA promotions. There's a scene in which Duke, the hippie, the unemployed hippie who made the free throw, is paid uh, $2,300 with a letter promising the balance will be paid when Moon's NBA buyout is final. Then the credits roll to the tune of Love Me Sexy. Semi-Pro is an interesting movie, if for no other reason than it allows us to revisit an interesting chapter in American sports history. The NBA was formed in 1947, and for the most part, it was a joke for the first 20 years of its existence. Take, for example, Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game on uh, March 2nd, 1962. This photograph of Chamberlain holding up a piece of paper with 100 written on it is the only video record of this game. The game was not recorded on video, not broadcast on television, and only a radio broadcast of the fourth quarter remains. Only the popularity of the UCLA Bruins, um, coached by John Wooden, and had a string of NCAA championships in the 1960s and 1970s, made basketball popular now. They uh, had this player called Lou Alcindor, a.k.a. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was instrumental in making the UCLA Bruins competitive. Um, So by the late 1960s, NBA franchises were becoming expensive. The appeal of the American Basketball Association, abbreviated ABA, was not to piggyback off of the increasing popularity of professional basketball. Rather, the appeal of the ABA was that for half the price of an NBA team, you could buy an an ABA team, and since the ultimate objective was that the NBA would absorb the ABA, you'd ultimately own an NBA team, or, well, the resolution was that the only four teams would survive the merger, Um, and, well, I guess you could uh, liquidate the teams, so it wouldn't be a total loss. Um, And the ABA itself had an appeal, with a more wide-open, flashy style of offensive play, as well as the difference in rules, uh, for example, a 30-second shot clock versus the NBA's uh, 24-second clock, and the use of a uh, three-point field goal and a more colorful uh, ball, which is red, white, and blue, instead of the NBA's more traditional orange ball. Uh, Semi-Pro, thus, is basically historical fiction because it tells the story of a fictional team, the Flint Tropics. Profits from a one-hit wonder might not be enough to buy an NBA team, but enough to buy an ABA team. So thus the plot of the movie is loser redeems itself type of storyline. Jackie Moon, the owner of an ABA team, could parlay this into an NBA team if the Flint Tropics finished fourth. Jackie and the team work hard and it looks like fourth place is within sight. Uh, Jackie might be able to redeem himself. Yet the resolution of this plot is bizarre. The ABA announces that Flint isn't a big enough market, 
the tropics will be dissolved. Thus, Jackie, who thought they might not be a loser if, if he does certain things, finds out that he will be a loser after all. But if the tropics win against the Spurs, maybe he won't be a loser. Uh, the storyline is basically formulaic and predictable, and you know it's going to happen with the team winning its final match against the Spurs. Um, the actors in this movie did pretty well. Um, Will Ferrell did a good job of uh, uh, playing Jackie Moon, whose ego writes checks that his body can't cash. Uh, Woody Harrelson does well as Ed Monix, the burnout athlete saddling up for one more ride. And Maura Tierney does a good job as the ex-girlfriend of Monix. Also, David Kochner, who we, la who we last saw as the annoying neighbor in Extract, does pretty well. Um, and, uh, let's see, but other than that, the plot creaks, and the movie is essentially boring. Uh, the movie did have some funny moments, like Jackie Moon wrestling the bear, and the owner's meetings. Also, the play-by-play the -play segments are funny, and you have to wonder if Farrell is drawing on his own experience in sports broadcasting. But a lot of these moments have nothing to do with the plot of the movie, uh, making for a disjointed storyline. Ultimately, semi-pro isn't that funny, and I really didn't laugh in any part of the movie. Another problem with this movie is that it was very vulgar, with many testicle jokes, crude language, and vomiting references. Uh, this would be okay if it made the movie funny, but it, it really didn't. Uh, there's one sex scene that is non-nude, uh, so, you know... It seems this vulgarity was just there to justify an R rating. Basically, the movie was not child-friendly, uh, which would be justified if the movie was funny, but it wasn't. So there's it's basically like a vulgar, unfunny movie. Um, if you are a Will Ferrell fan, there's nothing here that will make you a Will Fer Ferrell fan. Um, uh, this movie is kind of meh. Worth it because if you're interested in sports history, you'll find it stimulating enough. But the casual fan could probably skip it. I give it a 5 out of 10. This movie can be configured for digital 5.1 and stereo surround sound. It has English and Spanish subtitles. There's Sneak Peeks, which has a bunch of movie trailers. You can play the whole movie or select a scene. This movie can be configured for widescreen and full screen. Other than that, there's no special content, really no director's commentary, and no documenting on the making of the movies. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, this was an okay set of extras, but it kind of was a little bit uh, disappointing, a little bit of a letdown. Well, in conclusion, uh, this is a. I bought the Will Ferrell three film collection. I didn't get to watch the other two movies. Um, I did watch Semi Pro, which was an okay movie, but the DVD extras didn't really do much to recommend uh, the DVD. Um, if I view the other two movies, maybe I'll gain a more favorable view of this collection. The other two movies are Get Hard and The Campaign. So, you know, maybe I'll watch the other two movies, but right now, I'd only slightly recommend it. But, uh, I have to say, it was $6.99, so the uh, price is right, so you really can't go wrong. That's it for this DVD review. Um, and I know what we're going to do next week. I have The Big Lebowski which arrived only $4.99, so you know, I'll be reviewing that in, in uh, the next low-budget reviews. Um, so like the video and comment on it, hit the subscribe button to be informed of the latest low-budget review. As always, thanks for watching.